Uh, look, good evening. My name is uh, Nick Hughes. I'm the Group Chief Operating Officer for UBS here in Australia and New Zealand, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight uh, to the first of the Look Who's Talking series in 2013 on the internationalisation of law and the legal business. The size of the crowd here suggests there's a lot of interest in this topic. It's certainly been an interesting phenomena uh, to watch unfold over the past few years wearing my um, investment bank has had. Like you, I look forward to hearing Stephen and Michael's observations uh, about the different strategic approaches to internationalisation that their uh, two firms uh, have uh, pursued. In the audience uh, here tonight, we've got University of New South Wales Law School alumni, um, uh, present uh, law students and staff, uh, as well as staff from King and Wood Mallisons and Allens, two firms that are very well known to all of us here at UBS. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to the Dean, Professor David Dixon, uh, and the L Law Alumni and Network President, Tim Gordon. This is the first Law Alumni event at UBS, so it's, very, it's a very special occasion for us, and I do hope there will be many more in the years ahead. Aside from myself, uh, a number of senior UBS uh, Australian staff are uh, law school alumni from UNSW, including Matthew Grounds, who is our country head, and he sends his apologies uh, tonight as he's travelling overseas. Chris Madden, who is our regional general counsel for the investment bank. A number of our um, bankers in what we call our IBD, or investment banking department, as well as a large number of uh, my colleagues in the legal and compliance department. In fact, HR tell me uh, that UBS has hired 36 graduates from the uh, University of New South Wales over the past 12 years, including 14 law school graduates. So it's great to see that uh, my alma mater is uh, so well represented here. It's now my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Dixon to the lectern who will make some opening remarks and introduce our speakers. Thanks very much and um, enjoy tonight. Well, thank you, Nick, and welcome, everybody. Great to see so many people here th this evening. I, I'd just like to start with a, a couple of thank yous to, um, well, to, to our speakers for, for coming, to, to James Ayres, who I think is still forgiving me for my attempt to try and teach him criminal law about 20 years ago. He's glad to see that he survived that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and particular thanks to uh, Stephen men's and to Michael Rose. And just to make a comment about the, the two firms that they, they, they represent, uh, UNSW has got, had a, a strong relationship with, uh, I should, I'll just call them Mallisons and Allens, despite what we're going to talk about. <laughs> right. so you don't, don't mind. For a long time. And the support which they give us is, is, tr is really invaluable. Um, uh, King and Wood Mallisons, particularly, I've got to acknowledge tonight the uh, the wonderful support that they've recently given to us through the sponsorship of a new chair in financial regulation in, in association with the Centre for International Finance and Regulation, which is to be held by uh, Professor Ross Buckley. And uh, similarly, Allens has been a long-term supporter of what the law school has been doing in, in many, many ways. And it's, it's in, invaluable to us to have that kind of support from uh, our key supporters down in, 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 the, in the city, and it's, it's so great to see our senior alumni in the kind of positions that uh, these people are in. So, and thank you to them for the, their time this evening. The um, topic of this evening's uh, Q&A is, is one which anybody who's not been asleep for the last five years will know is one of the key issues in the law and in legal business. Um, there, was a, there was a great uh, introduction to the, the issue by Nicola Wakefield Evans from Kingwood Mallisons in a recent edition of Alumni News, which touched on some of the, 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 the issues. It's very relevant to us at, at the law school. And some of the, the things that we've been doing out there recently are, are very much reflected in the, 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 the kind of debates which I hope we'll be hearing about tonight. So that... The, one of the key elements of our, the new curriculum 
which has been introduced for the LLB and the JD students this year, uh, includes uh, a, a really significant shift towards an international focus, which there never was when I did my law degree about three million years ago, when it was entirely focused uh, on domestic English law, apart from a, an excruciatingly boring course on international law, which I managed to, to sleep through almost entirely. Instead of that kind of approach, what we're doing in the new curriculum is having a, a, a new core course on law and global context, rather than the approach taken at other universities of making people do public or private international law. We're designing a specific course which introduces students to the new ideas of where law is going, and also running international themes through the rest of the curriculum. And also, thirdly, providing unparalleled opportunities for our students to experience law in the world, in action overseas, through uh, our summer schools, our internships, our, the international clinics, like the, the ones which we've just recently run in Johannesburg and uh, will be repeating soon in uh, Hong Kong and the Human Rights Summer School at uh, Columbia in July. So it's a completely different experience, which I hope that we're, what we're doing is preparing uh, our students for the new world of an internationalized legal business that we're, we're going to hear about tonight. I think the, the changes that we've been talking about the law school and the kind of people that we're producing, both the younger people in the audience, some of the more senior people here, are one of the reasons why the, the law school has done so well in some of the international rankings. Uh, those of you who haven't seen the, the recent QS ranking, which was published a couple of weeks ago, might like to know that uh, UNSW was ranked 12th in the world uh, in, in the list of, of, of law schools. It means that we're up there with the, the very, very best law schools uh, in, in the world. And we, I have to say with Rosalind Dixon sitting in the front row that we were well above the University of Chicago Law School, <laughs> which is uh, hardly an objective measure. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is, is a, a more personal thing before I pass over to James, which is that um, Hillary Blackman, where, where's Hillary? Hillary Blackman's out the door. Hillary Blackman's our development manager who has been at UNSW for the, about five years now and has been absolutely crucial to what we've done in our engagement with the, uh, with the profession, uh, with our alumni, and not least in negotiating, for example, the King and Wood Mallison's chair. And uh, I'd just like to publicly thank her for all the work that she's done. She leaves us tomorrow to move down to, to Melbourne. So thank you all for coming and thank you to our, our speakers tonight. I'll pass over to James. I suppose the could have a debate about the catalyst for you know what got all of the all of the merger deals um, started. I mean I remember reporting on the arrival of Alan Overy um, in the market in early 2010. Uh, you know, and they arrived here through um, you know the strategic acquisition of a couple of key partners from Clayton Newts and, and, and went about things that way. I think very quickly, uh, Norton Rose arrived through a, a big merger with Deakins. A year later, we had, um, in early 2011, Clifford Chance arrived through the acquisition of some boutique firms in Sydney and in Perth. And then in the first half of last calendar year, things really accelerated. Um, Alan striking a strategic alliance with Linklaters, Malice and Stephen Jakes doing their merger with King and Wood. Uh, Ashhurst's um, um, uh, and Blake Dawson merging, Blake Dawson becoming Ashhurst's, uh, Herbert Smith and Freehills merging and Freehills maintaining that, their, their name under that structure. Uh, and that all was sort of in the period of, um, of about four months. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about the existing firms, uh, you know, the Cause Chambers, Westgast, Gilbert and Tobin, Clayton Newts, who are Minter Ellison, who are, you know, maintaining their, um, their, their, their presence here without being part of, of, that, um, of that movement. So it's a really interesting time, I think, to be having this discussion. And before I um, ask Stephen and Michael to discuss the um, rationale and, and the strategy behind the particular deals that they did, and there are um, very interesting stories there, uh, I thought I'd, I'd ask by, uh, uh, you know, 
start the proceedings by just getting you to talk a little bit about how you have arrived um, in the positions that you find yourself in now in terms of, um, briefly, Stephen, I, I might start with you. I mean, I gather you started from an investment banking background and sort of landed at, at Mallison's at a time when it was dealing with national mergers and things have obviously become globalised um, now, but how did your uh, experience uh, in the law um, um, put you in position to deal with the issues that you're facing now? I, um, I left the University of New South Wales Law School and became an investment banker for uh, five years. And I worked for a firm which was in Cornwall and Grenfell, which is globalised into Deutsche Bank. Um, and I worked in Australia and the UK. However, and, and people like Nick would understand this, I, I did work out that I didn't really understand discounted cash flows and, and really <laughs> To be an investment banker, that did seem to be a fairly prime requisite. So um, I, I, I moved on to um, what was then Stephen Jake's Stone James, which had offices simply in uh, Sydney, Perth and, and Canberra. So it was a very different world. Very quickly, um, there was all of the interstate mergers in Australia. And um, for us, that occurred in 1987. But it's fair to say that, you know, some of those mergers struggled and I went as a partner to Melbourne in 1992 as part of the effort to try and glue those firms together. And I've been there pretty much, pretty much ever since. Um, had a whole bunch of roles throughout the firm uh, in management, particularly running things like the corporate M&A group. And, um, took a whole series of roles and, and finally ended up as about the third oldest partner as the chairman of the firm at what is a pretty interesting time. Well, we'll get to the, um, to the issues of merging your, your firm with a Chinese firm, but just very quickly, how did you find um, dealing with different cultures in Sydney and Melbourne? Well, as I, I said to... <laughs> um, it's a really unfair question. <laughs> Well, on the basis that there are hopefully few Melbourne people here. Um, so um, I, I did express the view to, to James that um, perhaps, you know, the cultural difference between um, Sydney and Beijing is, is somewhat less than the cultural difference between uh, <laughs> Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne. But, you know, the, the reality was when we, we merged those firms, they were very separate firms with a strong desire to uh, maintain the culture of those firms. And people were suspicious of the merger. They were suspicious of the other interstate offices. And it took, um, I think, you know, a good 10 to 15 years to really knit those firms together. And, and certainly, um, it's we'll perhaps come on to this, but in fact, I want to use some of the experiences and the lessons we learned in trying to pull together firms back in you know, 1990 and 1991, which I think is going to be very relevant to what we're trying to do in terms of knitting ourselves together with King and Wood now. Um, and Michael, I, I understand you began as a paralegal at, at Allen's back in the day and pretty much spent your whole career there? Yeah, no, I began um, actually as a summer clerk when yeah. I was still, yeah. still at university and uh, I stayed on as a paralegal. And I suppose relevant to today's discussion, which is about internationalisation, uh, in my second week as a paralegal, uh, the partner for whom I was working, a guy called Jim Dwyer, said, look, we've got this case. It's for these people called the Al-Fayeds. Can you go to Paris and stay in the Ritz Hotel for three weeks and just read the documents? So, Sure, Jim. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Jim. Uh, so, you know, I was 21 years old, wearing a really bad suit, uh, staying in the Anne Frank suite at the Ritz Hotel and, and thinking, uh, the lesson for me is always look for the international component <laughs> of any job. And, and that's pretty much what I did um, throughout my career, which was uh, uh, practising as a litigator. And um, I understand you, you, you might have thought at one point Allens wasn't moving fast enough in terms of uh, uh, dealing with these forces yeah. of globalisation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when I was been at Allens for about five or six years, we had a New York office at the time, and I um, moved to New York and I worked in New York on the News Corp acquisition of Star TV. And then I said, well, I think Hong Kong's now the centre of the world. And so I moved to Hong Kong and spent some time there. And when I came back to Australia, 
I thought, well, it's just not international enough. There was uh, a few firms, let's call them accounting firms, that were building international legal platforms at the time. It was one of my former colleagues uh, there. Um, and so I went across to one of the accounting firms and I was there for about a month before I thought I'd really made a terrible mistake. So um, it took me another six months to get back to Allen's. Um, but uh, I did get back and never lost my belief that the, the, the most fun work is the work that's got the travel vouchers in the file. So um, <laughs> that's what, I, what I've stayed with. Um, well, you've done your, been doing your current job, Michael, for sort of six years or, or so. Um, just lead us into uh, your thinking about the uh, alliance that we all know you, you struck with, with Linklaters. When did the firm start to think about needing to do that deal and was yep. there a catalyst for it? Like I mentioned in my introduction, the sort of Alan and Overy arrival and all of that. I mean, was that it or um, was well, it yeah. before that? Can I argue a bit with you about the Alan and Overy arrival? Oh, absolutely. I think a, lot, a lot of people think that the internationalization of the Australian legal market began then. But if you, if you look back, I don't know when Baker and McKenzie arrived in Australia, maybe it was 1956 or something. Yeah. Um, and you've had Scadden Arps and some US firms yeah, you've here. Yeah, you've had a, had a, a lot time. of US firms here. You've had a lot of US firms flying people in and out of here. But more importantly, uh, you've had firms like our firm and, and uh, Mallison's as it then was and, and a number of other firms pushing out in the region. So, you know, when uh, when Alan Overy arrived, someone rang me up and said, what do you think about the internationalization of the Australian legal profession? I think we had 13 overseas offices you know, when, that, uh, when I was asked that question, probably by you. It um, might have been, actually. <laughs> we did get very excited about the arrival of Alan and Overy, but I mean, and, and, and there may, I mean, look, I definitely take your point, the Australian firms have had um, global offices, including in Asia and in New York for, um, for decades. Yeah. We have seen, uh, global firms here as well. And I remember when I was studying at UNSW and doing um, you know, the summer clerkship thing, I think Baker and McKenzie was certainly here and they were the only firm that you could join with the prospect the of Paris getting a Paris trip. <laughs> they were very, they were very yeah. popular. I suppose now things are quite different for students. So, so but, I, think, yeah. I think Alan and Overy arriving was actually a symptom of something rather than the cause of something. And what it was a symptom of was this, that you had law firms predominantly based in Europe, but some based in the United States, and they were looking at their home markets and thinking there's no growth here. Um, it was at the start of the GFC. There's no growth here for the next two or three years. Now, now they think there's no growth at home for the next 10 or 12 or 15 years. So they looked around the world for growth and they said, where are we gonna see that growth? And at first, firms like Alan Overy said, we well, might find it in Eastern Europe, we might find it in the Middle East. But eventually everyone figured out when they were looking at the global trade flows that there were massive trade flows out of Asia and a lot of those were coming uh, to Australia. And so people thought if we can plug ourselves into that flow, um, the flow of capital from North Asia down to Southeast Asia and Australia and the flow of minerals and energy from the South back to the North, if we can plug into that, um, then there's something we can, where we can see some growth. And so you had people begin to arrive in the Australian market to do that, to get a piece of those flows. And some thought, we'll go with our existing clients and we'll go small and we'll service those clients. Others thought, let's just land in Australia because maybe Australia is an aircraft carrier and we can use it to go into Asia, which I don't think was a very smart idea. Uh, and others thought, let's go large and we'll, we'll you know, uh, align ourselves with, with existing firms. So different people had different strategies, but essentially they were trying to fit their existing practices and their existing client relationships onto um, what they saw as some of the better what, flows of investment. But what forced you to move? Like when were you starting to think that um, as a firm we might need to strike yeah. some sort of formal alliance with someone outside this jurisdiction to make sure we remain in the flows? Yeah, so we saw a couple of things happening which, were, which made us realise we needed to do something. The first was, you know, you used to have a model where multinationals who were predominantly our clients had a single headquarters. Maybe that headquarters was in New York, maybe it was somewhere in the Midwest if they were manufacturers, maybe it was in London, sometimes it was in Tokyo. So if you were able to cover those cities with your marketing or with your own branch network, then you could touch the origination points which mattered for the Australian market. But as, as multinationals started to become multi-headquartered, 
And as new sorts of people became important clients, so like the sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East or the sovereign wealth fund in Singapore or um, Chinese SOEs, for example, all of a sudden you had to be in 35 origination points if you were going to be relevant, even in the Australian market. And you had to be in those origination points with a name that people knew and understood. And we had this magnificent name in Australia. But if we were in Singapore, we were getting confused with Alan and Gledhill. If we were in Dubai, we were getting confused with Alan and Overy. No one understood what Alan's Arthur Robinson meant once you were beyond the countries in which we operated. So you had to touch those orig origination points. You had to have uh, a name that people could understand in the global context. And we also had to have uh, a network where we could stay with our clients as they moved out of Australia. And to build that kind of network off an Australian base is almost impossible. You can do it in, in nine countries in Asia, but that's, you know, you, you can't, you just don't have the power of an Australian base to invest in North America or to invest in the Middle East. So, uh, so we, had to, we had to acquire that network through another mechanism. Yeah. And we might come to the mechanisms um, shortly and obviously I'd like to discuss with, um, with you guys the sort of alliance approach versus the full merger approach. But let me just bring Stephen in at this point. Uh, same sort of question, I suppose. Um, you know, as I understand it, Mallison's had been, you know, looking for, um, you know, a global tie-up for, you know, many years before um, doing the King and Wood deal last year. And, and we know that Clifford Chance and even mm. Linklater's, I think, have been um, mentioned as potential, as potential um, partners over the over the years. Um, what uh, was the catalyst for you to um, to to start the process of of, of, of doing the King and Wood deal? Um, I, I think, as Michael said, we've been international quite a long time, and we've been trying to be international. And I can remember the first partners meeting I went to in 1988, you know, involved setting up an office in Hong Kong. And as you said, we, we spoke to a number of firms, including Linklaters and Cliff and Champs over the last 12 to 14 years. So the desire was always there. And I was just reflecting then in what actually caused it to happen. And like all things, in a sense, it's a bit like the time has come, but I do think just in a sense, perhaps partly repeating what Michael said, is that Asia suddenly became more important. And that just sort of gave a push behind these. Because in a sense, whilst we were always, we always saw the importance of an international network, just trying to get other firms across the line to see Australia as relevant was, was very difficult. And I think that just the strength of Asia and then the strength, the Australian economic strength during that period sort of caused a bit of a snowball effect. And, and I think then to a degree, the deals which got done with Alan and Overy and Clifford Chance and Norton Rose, in a sense, just provided that momentum to get the snowball rolling down the, down the hill. Um, and are we right to think of King & Wood Mallisons now as, a, as an Asian firm? I mean, how do you think of yourself with respect to the Asian play versus the, full inter the fully international play. Michael was talking about the pools of capital yeah. and you've obviously got pools of capital in Europe, and pools of capital in the Middle East and all the rest of that. But are you very much focused on, on, on China, on yeah. broader well, Asia? Asia? I mean, we are not trying to replicate a um, Linklater's or a Freshfields or a um, Clifford Charts. What we see ourselves as is, um, an international law firm based in Asia. And what we really mean by that is to have a dominant position in particularly things like M&A going into Asia in terms of um, inbound investment, outbound investment from Asia, and in terms of M&A throughout the Asian region. And, and I think, you know, a similar power and position in respect of banking and, and finance um, we're never going to have a, we don't think, big standalone practice in the UK or the US, but we do want to be very strong in terms of uh, Chinese, Asian and Australian companies who want to make acquisitions in Europe. 
Um, and there has been a little bit of, um, of, of speculation about uh, you doing a deal with a UK firm. Like, is yeah. that something that's, that's sort of on the cards? I think that we, we're not commenting on any specific deals at all, but in the end, we do want to build capability. And I think it's fairly sensible that in the end, you're going to need to acquire strong English law capability and ultimately strong US law capability. Those are very important legs in any international network. Yeah. All right, so how about um, we just turn to the uh, full merger approach versus the alliance approach. I'm just interested in, in hearing, um, I mean, as I understand it, I think um, before your merger with uh, King and Wood, Gilbert and Tobin had a, an alliance with them. So yep. um, what made you, um, you know, decide that you, you know, had confidence to get a full equity merger, you know, um, through uh, the partnership and how's that been? Uh, and I'll come to Michael afterwards to just talk about the differing approach in, in what an alliance means. Um, well, I, I think that um, we, what we wanted in a sense was to have a real influence over our destiny. And in a sense, the opportunity to merge with King and Wood came up and it was one of those things that <coughs> arose, you know, we'd spoken to them, we'd stayed in good contact with them. But in the end, the opportunity to link up with the leading law firm in China um, just seemed an opportunity which we could build on and expand, but use it as a base. And uh, in the end, what uh, we bring to that merger is um, experience in running an international law firm. Um, we bring expertise in a number of product areas. Um, we bring expertise in things like client management and that sort of thing. What King and Wood very much bring to it is that um, the China expertise, the understanding of regulatory, and really in the end, a big bank of clients and potential clients, which, you know, um, we just, coming from a small country like Australia, don't have. And I think what we see is the capacity to meld those together um, will provide for our clients uh, and then ultimately our staff sort of the best and strongest opportunity to go forward. You went a different different way, uh, Michael. Was a full merger with Linklater something that you considered? Was the alliance thing always how you wanted to, to, to do it? I mean, why did we go for an alliance? Um, we never sought a full merger with anyone. And in fact, uh, I remember I would be visiting law firms in London and I would be the 19th Australian managing partner that they would have seen that month. And they'd sort of yawn and say, do you want to talk to us about merger? And I'd say, no, not at all. And I think when you look at what's happened and how many different models there have been, what, what they reflect, I think, is two things. The first is the starting point that each firm has. And the second is, where in a newly segmenting market they want to end up. Um, and, and I think maybe King of Wood Mallisons is an exception to that because you had such a clear idea of what you were looking to do and you were sort of stepping out of a, a set of segmentation because it was just such a clear China strategy. And so, you know, I, I really admire the deal that, that uh, King of Wood Mallisons did. I think it's really quite visionary. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, Courageous, you, you would know, say. I think, <laughs> well, <laughs> courageously visionary. Um, but, but uh, and history will tell. But for, for a lot of the others, <laughs> for a lot of the others, what people chose depended on what they had. So, you know, just to give you some examples, some people said, our brand isn't very powerful, even in the Australian market. So if we have to give up our name to do something else, then we'll do it. Some people said, uh, uh, you know, we are not going to survive in the top tier of the Australian market. We should move to the second tier. Um, if we're going to segment into the second tier, let's find a second tier firm globally and segment into that. Some people said, we don't have, we don't have a very strong internal culture, so if we have to make radical cultural changes to merge with somebody, um, let's do that. For us, we had a couple of things which we knew we needed and a lot of things we knew that we would not give away. So we wanted a network, we needed a leading global brand, we wanted a name and a brand that would cement us into the global top tier 
And we said, we're not giving away these things. We're not giving away control of our business. We're not giving away our name in the Australian market because of how valuable it is uh, and because of its, you know, what it means for our history and our culture as an organisation. So we made a, you know, we literally, with a whiteboard, we made a list. We need this stuff and we don't need this stuff. And, you, and that gave us a list of people that we should talk with and a list of things that we should seek to come out with and that's what we achieved. And you talked about uh, control there as being a key thing. You wanted to maintain control and an alliance was the right way to do that. But Stephen, you also say that control was important for you and you've yeah. gone the full merger and do you feel like the control is, is, is still there? We think we have a significant influence. And, and I mean that in quite a genuine way, is that uh, Mallison's and King and & Wood are the two founding partners. Now, you know, time will tell um, if the firm continues to, to grow, but we do think that we will have a much greater influence in that firm than if we had joined what was an existing very large network. Yeah. And and I would agree with that. And we would have had magnificent control had we merged with the number two firm in Pittsburgh. But we decided not to um, we, because we wanted to be in a particular tier. And so we knew that in terms of control across the network, we could never achieve that in that tier. What we could achieve, though, was continued control over our own destiny and our own culture here in the Australian market, which for, for our partners and I think the people who work in our firm is an important thing. All right. Um, I'd like to ask you about how um, both staff, lawyers, and, and also clients have, have responded to the um, to the deals that, that you've done. Uh, one thing that I always sort of you know struggle a little bit to, to think about when I was thinking about the rationale for these deals was for a client or for a lawyer who's just got a solely domestic focused practice, uh, be it litigation or property or occupational health and safety or whatever it happens to be. Uh, what does this deal mean for me as a partner or me as a client who want um, you know domestic work done and I imagine that's still a you know a reasonable chunk of both of your businesses so how have you managed that process sort of internal management of, of, of staff expectations and client expectations especially for those that aren't uh, cross-border merger and acquisition clients but are just bread and butter clients that have used your firm for, for, for decades and what more of the same not necessarily anything well, different. You really asked two questions, didn't you? One is, what does it mean for people who are mostly domestic practitioners? And then what does it mean for clients? Is that yeah, really? Yeah, that, that's right. Mostly domestic clients okay. as well. How do you... Yeah. Well, so for domestic practitioners, let's say your client is um, the ANZ Bank and you're beavering away in Melbourne working for the ANZ Bank. Uh, and the ANZ Bank says, we're going we're to become Asian now, and a lot of our business is going to take place in Asia. And by the way, Alan, can you help us with this? Uh, and if the answer is no, and we actually don't even have a network that can help you, ANZ might well say, well, we'll give this job to Alan and Overy. And then a week later, Alan and Overy in Singapore is selling back into the ANZ from Singapore and Sydney. And so your client relationship, which you held tightly, is now no longer held tightly, and you've you've you, you've but you've you've lost the grip. Yeah. But you're 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 picking A and Z as as an example of a client that sort of is very obviously Asian, you know, wants to expand. So I can I can clearly understand the benefits um, that an international alliance might bring to an A and Z. But what about um, you know Stockland or whatever a domestic property trust well, that just wants to buy another Australian property in our company, firm, I, in our firm I reckon you're down to client 250 before you find yeah. someone who doesn't have some kind of international uh, engagement whether it's their investors their shareholders their next project whatever so it's I think it's relevant to all uh, and then for the lawyers themselves um, well I'm probably hogging this why don't you answer that no, you, no, you yeah, go. Okay. Well, gonna... <laughs> well um, for, for, for lawyers themselves um, Again, it's this the interconnectedness of our economy with every other economy. Even if you are someone who would regard themselves as purely domestic, I don't think there really is any such thing as purely domestic. And, and increasingly, the decisions which get made, even in purely domestic work in Australia, are not necessarily decisions that get made in Australia. Mm. So if, if there's going to be the acquisition of... Um, some wind farm on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, 
and that acquisition is going to be by the Australian subsidiary of a Swiss utility, the decision about that acquisition might get made in Singapore or in Zurich um, or, or you know, somewhere else in the world. And the person who's making that decision might know nothing about the Australian legal market, might never have heard of Allens or Mallisons or Freehills. And so um, even your purely domestic work on that basis, um, unless you're able to project internationally, you might not have a chance to secure it. Stephen, on the same topic. Yeah, I, I guess I have a slightly different experience in the sense of, I think certainly to date, there are a group of partners and solicitors who, who probably don't have a lot of involvement with the, the international practice. Um, if you are doing just certain amounts of domestic, or even just some domestic M&A, um, some uh, litigation, et cetera. And one of the challenges we have is, is ensuring that we actually engage those people in the growth and expansion of the firm, because we lawyers are wonderful people, but broad vision isn't necessarily one of them. And I think it's something which we actually have to bring the people along. And, and I know we have exactly the same experience in China. If you're working in some of the, the Chinese offices, you, you just don't have that same, same thing. How's that been, trying to bring them along? Has it been um, harder than you might have anticipated? Um, no, because in a sense, you, you are going to have the same group of people there, like here. Some people embrace the whole vision and are keen from day one to, to be out there and being part of it. Some people will sort of stand back and, and wait for it to, to come to them. And, and some people think it's just never going to, to affect me. Now, I think it's going to affect them more broadly than it does. Um, and a somewhat similar experience with um, uh, the solicitors who, who work for us. A and the critical there, again, is those who kind of reach out and try and grab the opportunity. So I had a lawyer who um, came to see me, obviously a very uh, sensible guy, and he said he was going on holidays to, to China and wanted to go and visit the King and Wood offices in, in Beijing. And it's just interesting. Some of them grab the opportunities and others don't. But I'm sure that wasn't a tax deductive trip. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, but um, uh, just finally, though, in, in a sense, when you're saying sort of what does it do for you is the other thing I think is, is an effect on the brand, which is a fairly critical element, which is do you want to be known as a, a, a firm like our clients, which are going international? Most of our clients are, in fact, multinationals um, or their investment banks. And I think that, in a sense, having a brand which is an international brand of itself has a benefit just to the, even the domestic practice. Because, you know, there are clients in Australia who really will never use us outside of Australia and they're quite big, quite big companies. What, what do you think about the uh, domestic firms that haven't pursued mergers? And I'm, you know, thinking probably Coors, Clayton, Newt, Gilbert and Tobin. They're now talking about uh, that as being an advantage to be purely domestically focused. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Are they trying to attract, um, you know, clients? So, I mean, you both have said that most of your clients are very global, very international. You'd get down to 250 before you found the domestic one. So I just wonder, if that's the case, then you probably don't, don't mind too much if they want to take that domestic focus. But... Uh, you know, what, 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 what's the reality of, of, of uh, uh, I mean, I said, what do you make of their um, arguments that all of a sudden they're in a better position now by being only domestically focused? You go. Well, I, I, I don't want to talk about those firms specifically, but I'd say two things. The first is, underneath the overall internationalisation that's been happening is a really rigid segmentation which is going on in the Australian market where um, uh, clients are starting to disaggregate their work and segment their work and they're sending top tier work to top tier firms. They're sending a lot of their uh, uh, flow and commodity work out to firms which you know might be bottom of the second tier, top of the third tier. They're keeping a lot of work in house uh, and they're putting some out into the mid-tier. And um, 
what that means, if you're in, if, if you're in that middle band, actually internationalization is probably the curious choice. And so some of these very small US firms that are arriving in the Australian market and then plugging away, well, they're not actually international firms, they're really more multi-local firms. Is that they're, like a Middleton, like the K&L Middleton? Possibly, K &L Gates. yeah, I don't know the precise yeah, details, yeah. But, but you know, the point that if you're, if you're taking a global brand but just chipping away at purely local work, then what you're really doing is building a multi-local model. And I, to, for myself, I don't, I don't really understand what the benefits are in that model, except maybe some economies of scale. Um, uh, so, uh, as to f firms uh, in the top tier, my firm was probably the last firm to enter the national consolidation process. And it's because we occupied a great position in each city and it didn't really, it wasn't necessary for us to be in that process early. And what we found was that there was a real advantage in each city for a little while of being the firm that didn't consolidate because um, uh, there were all these people that needed to send referrals to you and they couldn't send them to other people who had already consolidated. But there's a crossover point in that because at some point everybody's merged with somebody else and so they, don't, they stop sending you referrals. Now, if you're an independent firm in Sydney five years ago, uh, you would be getting referrals from Ashurst and from Clifford Chance and from Linklaters and from King and & Wood and, um, you know, from a variety of firms, none of whom refer work to anybody except themselves now. Mm. So maybe those, maybe the tipping point hasn't been passed yet, but there is a point at which not having a strong affiliation with a network or not being a network um, probably starts to hurt you rather than to help you. Yeah. And just maybe quickly, Stephen, just interested in, on, you know, on your thoughts. I mean, um, based on that logic, I suppose, we'll see the rest of the top tier consolidate at some point in time or, 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 or fail. Um, what, what do you think? Are they going to be able to... Um, <laughs> I, I, I love your binary world. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I don't think they'll fail. And when you talk to, to those firms, they see it as a very clear strategic choice and they see themselves having the opportunity to get referrals from what is still a large number of law firms in Europe and the US who do not have operations in Australia. But I think that we have a, a somewhat similar view to Michael in that, you know, I think that holding yourself free and, and running it on referrals in the end is not going to be a model which works well over time. And that really comes back to my earlier point about where decisions get made about legal spend in Australia. Because if they're not made here and you're, and you're only here, then people don't know who you are. What are your thoughts on the US firms? The, uh, um, we obviously talked about Baker McKenzie being here for a long time, Jones Day are in this market, and Scadden Arps have been in this market for a long time, um, bringing Australian companies into the US debt capital markets. But the white shoe firms, uh, you know, your Davis, you know, uh, Davis Pokes or Cravats or the like, uh, you know, very much um, focused on, you know, on New York from the looks of things. I mean, you've just been over there, Michael, you were saying um, before, you've just come back from the US. I mean, do you see uh, any uh, um, competitive threat from um, the big names of Wall Street any so anytime soon? No, I don't. Um, if you come out of your elevator and Wall Street's there waiting for you, you don't really have too much incentive to go further to, to find work. If you look at the big New York firms, um, what they've done is, if they've gone offshore at all, um, they've put a, a bureau into London uh, and they've put a bureau maybe into Hong Kong to pick up the front end of capital markets work that's going into the United States. So they're really extensions of their domestic practice. Um, if you were a US firm and you were going to globalise, if you said, right, let's turn ourselves into Linklaters, um, uh, where would Australia be on your list of priorities um, after you dealt with the UK and Europe and China and Japan and Turkey uh, and Africa um, and Canada because it's close? Uh, you know, you, we'd be number 17 India if it liberalises. So it's, we're just not a big enough market. Uh, you know, I remember once taking the AMLAW 100, which is the, the published list of revenues of Americans top 100 law firms, 
and putting overlaying the, <coughs> the revenues from the big Australian, the big three Australian firms. And I think you guys had a bigger revenue than us, so you were the number two firm in Minneapolis, I think. Uh, and, and, and we were, and that was about 60 in the list, and, and we were, you know, the number two firm in Denver or something. I mean, it just, we're just not of a scale that the American firms, are, are, I think, are thinking about, except these multi-local firms. Yeah, okay. Um, I'd be interested just to change gear a little bit and, and talk about the... Uh, I agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just talk about how the, um, you know, from the perspective of, of young lawyers, uh, how the role of, um, of lawyering um, might be changing in the current environment. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I said before in some of my remarks that you could, you know, you, you might have chosen a Baker McKenzie's, um, you know, when I was finishing law school as, you know, to provide you with a, an experience of practising law abroad, uh, but any of the top six, top eight uh, domestic law firms probably would have given you um, roughly the same experience. Uh, different clients, obviously, but the law you were doing is probably pretty similar across the board. And it's now certainly not the case. Uh, I wondered, you know, what you thought about um, students and people entering the the the, the profession uh, and the level of of thought, I suppose, they're they're giving to where they want to be and whether or not they're joining you because they're thinking about those sort of globalisation issues that we've, that we've discussed and, and, and I'll get you to answer that and I've got a few more well, on the same point. Absolutely. I mean, as you say, if, if you were um, a student only five or six years ago, in a sense, you, you probably had five or six firms who were really very similar and it probably just all reflected upon your summer clerk experience as to what you were going to do. Now, in fact, you have quite genuine choices to make and it will sort of affect how your career goes. And, and so clearly if um, uh, with King and Wood Mallisons, you know, we have a very clear focus on Asia, on China, and in the end we, we really want people who want to work in that region and have an interest in that region. And, you know, we think the opportunities are, are great um, but if your overwhelming desire was to work in New York or Paris, you might make a, a different choice. So it's some quite genuine differences now. Would you be looking for uh, um, Chinese speakers uh, 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 as prioritised over, over those that, that, that don't know the local language or have studied the culture or the history of Asia, um, you know, uh, I mean, is, is it started to go down to that level in terms of who you're trying oh, to look, source has. into the firm? It has. I mean, we, we still make the primary choice in terms of legal skills and, and legal ability. But, you know, from our perspective, holding those things equal to the extent to which you can speak Mandarin, for us, that's a, a huge benefit. And it's not so much, we, we do have, you know, 500 Mandarin speakers, so it's not really quite the challenge it used to be. But we do also want people who have an interest in, in Asia and who want to go and work in the region, uh, like dealing with people, like travelling there. And I think that's, that's important to us. And, and, and it's just quite interesting over the 12 months. I mean, the whole firm has sort of got, you know, an Asian interest and focus. Simply by what we've done, you become more aware of Asia, you become more aware of China. Uh, it's just quite interesting how that sort of seeped through the uh, through the firm. What about you, Michael? I mean, are you asking um, um, budding uh, employees sort of the global questions and trying to get a sense of their global perspective? Is that much more important now than it than it used to be? Um, well, I just think the generation of people who are graduating now are more globally aware. Anyway, so many people have a, an, an overseas component of their university study. Everybody's travelled. Um, uh, I, the thing that I'm thinking about a lot now is that we've had this 30-year period where things were relatively predictable and bankable. And in your career, you could sort of look at a 30-year slice of history and say, I'm going to go from here and I'm going to end up here. And now the big thing in, in the businesses of our clients and, and in the economies in which our firms operate is volatility. And 
uh, that means that workflows are going to chop and change, the specialties which are in demand are going to chop and change, and the thing that people need to build into their careers in order to deal with volatility is flexibility and mobility and um, resilience. And uh, you know, looking here, obviously lots of you are students. I mean, my, my, my suggestion to you would be to be thinking about careers at firms which will give you the capacity to move locations and expertise uh, or areas of practice um, and, and allow you to develop sectoral expertise because that's the thing that probably won't change. They're the, they're the sort of questions people should be asking of firms. Is, is, will I have a career that I can continue to build even though I'm building it against a background of quite severe volatility uh, around the world? Do you think that um, volatility makes it uh, uh, harder to be a, you know, a young lawyer these days? Like, a, is that the pressures greater, any greater than they, you know, than, than they normally are? I mean, do you think it's a pretty tough time to be coming into the profession, given the volatility? And, and, and um, I was mentioning this uh, outside. I was at this conference last week where um, uh, Larry Summers was, was speaking, the former US Treasury Secretary, and someone asked him that question. Do you think this is a bad time for, because he was the Dean of Harvard Law School, do you think this is a bad time for people who are entering the legal profession? And he, he made the observation that um, yes, but not for the obvious reasons. Ye yes, but not because the world's volatile and because business is tough. It's his, in his view, it's yes, because traditionally people have chosen careers in the law because they weren't interested in careers in business. And now the law is a business. Uh, and, it, and the complexity of practice and the complexity of firms is such that some of the hierarchical stuff and some of the, you know, some of the um, structural stuff that people used to choose the professions to get away from now exist in the professions. And it's not just the law, it's medicine, it's a whole lot of things which have corporatized in ways which are a challenge for people who want to think and act um, in, in different ways. So yeah, I, I do yeah. think it is, I think it's quite different. Um, it's quite different. It's less predictable, but it's also 100 times more exciting. You know, I had to be at Allen's for six years before, it, well, actually, that's not true. I got to Paris in my second week. But, I had to, <laughs> <laughs> but as a lawyer, I had to be at Allen's for six years before I could talk my way uh, to New York. And, and now, I'm sure it's the same in your firm, people can arrive. Um, and they can be seconded in anywhere, they can be positioned anywhere. Uh, and I just think, uh, yeah, it's harder and it's more complicated, but I think the rewards are much greater and the opportunities are um, superb. Stephen? Um, I think just the demands we put on the lawyers are so much greater than they were. Um, I think this commercial focus is is critical. Once upon a time as a lawyer, you just came and you kind of did the legal work. You didn't worry about budgets. You didn't worry about financial performance. You did not worry really about commercial advice. You wrote a 10-page letter and said, I've outlined the issues and it's up to you. And uh, and I think that whole approach has, has changed. And I just know the structure of our firm, in a sense, it's been restructured along um, effectively industry lines and people are much more aware of the environment in which they're, they're doing things. Uh, but as Michael says, the opportunities are, are that much greater. We're set, sending you know, second and third year lawyers on secondment to China. And you know, they're being uh, dumped into Beijing, they can't speak Mandarin and they need to make their, their way. And that's a huge opportunity for people. Along with this event, we've got quite a few uh, events coming up in the next few months. Uh, which the UNSW, uh, both alumni and students, should be aware of. We have a Careers at the Bar event coming up in July at Gilbert and Tobin. Um, we've got a London alumni drinks uh, showing the, the tentacles of internationalisation at work uh, with Professor Dixon. Uh, that's in June. We have a uh, alumni event for those alumni living and working in Canberra in July. And we'll also be having a spring party in October as well. So please keep up to date. Uh, follow the, the e -new newsletter that goes out. Um, sign up to our um, mailing list on our website and also our Facebook page. Um, there's plenty of stuff happening and there's plenty of ways to get involved. So I thank you all very much for coming and I encourage you to come to events in the future.